the idea that somehow in the 19th century and obviously into the 20th century, people come to, came to see faith as being at odds with science, rationality as being at odds with religious faith. And this becomes kind of baked into the way people think, including Einstein and uh, Sandage. And everybody seems to know that that's a fact. It, it's, it's the all, I call it the all reasonable people agree phenomenon. Yeah. We have that all over the place yeah, in the academic this, culture. Exactly. But out of the 19th century, all reasonable people seem to agree that science undermines belief in God well, and supports a kind of materialistic worldview, which then becomes the, the backdrop, the, the background assumption that people appropriate in doing science. And you may remember that quote from Richard Lewinton in the New York Review of Books, where he said, you know, we stand for science in spite of it, some of its most, uh, you know, counterintuitive constructs and some of its absurd formulations. And he's talking about things like the, probably the multiverse and things like that. But we stand for it because we cannot let a divine foot in the door, he said. He was very explicit right. about the idea that science has to presuppose materialism right. and only invoke materialistic explanations at all costs. Well, that, that's, wh that's why I was bringing this up, because I thought to myself, so th that's where we are, and it's where we've been you know, since the, the 19th century. But it was, in, in reading your book, and then the book that Thaxton and Nancy Piercy did about 20 years ago, that I was reminded, or maybe learned for the first time, I can never remember, but th the idea is that we have forgotten that it was Christian faith that led to what we call modern science and the scientific revolution. There's no debating that. You don't have to like it. It could make you grumpy, but it is history. There's no way around it. And non-Christians have written about it. You quote them uh, Joseph in, Needham, in your book. Yeah. Al, uh, a. N. Uh, North, Alfred North Whitehead. I mean, many of the leading... Uh, historians Herbert Butterfield, uh, uh, leading historians and historians of science of the 20th century, really rediscovered this in the wake of that conflict historiography, the idea that science and religion are at odds. And, uh, and, and they, they highlighted a number of factors, but there were presuppositions that came out of a Judeo-Christian worldview in particular. Um, our, 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 our friends in the Muslim world also had uh, uh, some contributed to science as well, but out of the a Abrahamic faith, but particularly in the period of the, the scientific revolution, ideas coming out of the Hebrew Bible that were being rediscovered by the reformers and, and a strain of thought in late medieval Catholicism kind of combined to make this, this scientific revolution possible. What kind of presuppositions? Things like the intelligibility of nature, that nature can be understood because the same rational intellect that made nature made our minds and gave us the gift of rationality that would enable us to understand the reason that was built into the, into the world. The idea of the order of nature, but also the idea that the order of nature is contingent on the will of the creator, that it could have been different. There's a lot, I used to use a paintbrush to illustrate with my students. You've got 15 different kinds of paintbrushes. They all do the same basic job, but they all are, are different in ways, and the one the painter uses is up to the painter's own choice. And so Newton discovered that gravity has an inverse square law, but it might have been an inverse cube law, or it may have been a strictly linear relationship or something else. So there's an order there, but not an order that we can deduce from first principles, okay. which is what you're... Right. Friends, the Greeks and, thought, and that and, right. That's yeah. what I. This is what I find so interesting. And again, I'm just I'm just familiar enough with this information to be dangerous with people who don't know more than I do, right? <laughs> and so, I I so I picked up a lot of this from from you and, and put it in my own book because I, you almost can't believe it when you see it. You think, how have I internalized some of this baloney that faith might be at odds? with science, not only is that not true, the opposite is true. We would not have modern science if not for devout Christians being Christian. It's not like to the side of their Christianity. Their Christian thinking led them to this. And you're getting to the idea now that, um, you know, part of what it means to believe in the God of the Bible is to believe in a personal God. Aristotle didn't believe in a personal God. And so you get all of these the, Aristotelians the, the, right. in late medieval world who have, they have an Aristotelian worldview which pushes against the idea of a quirky personal God. And so they insist that the planets, you know, have to be moving in circles. 
because circles are perfect and we know that. But what if a quirky personal god said, no, I'm going to I prefer I'm use ellipses, ellipses. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Uh, um, Which he did. And, and you're right. The, 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 the Greeks had this idea of the logos, an impersonal logic. And because it pervaded all of nature in their view, then whatever was logical uh, to, seemed logical to us must be the logic that's built into the world. So it implied, right. it, it allowed for a kind of reliance on armchair philosophizing when what was necessary was empirical investigation. Robert Boyle was famous for saying, it's not the job of the natural philosopher, which was what they called scientists at the time, to ask what God must have done, but instead to go and look and see what he actually did do. And that was the spirit of the scientific revolution. Let's go and look and see. Well, and, and, and the other part of it that brings in the faith is the humility to say that uh, we may think we know what it is, but we know we're sinners, we know we get stuff wrong, we're going to force ourselves to actually look. The, the great historian of science, uh, uh, Peter Harrison, has emphasized this. This is a contribution of, in particular, the Reformation thinkers. Because by emphasizing the depravity of man, ironically, they help make science possible. And the connection there is that, that yes, we can understand the order and design and, the, and, and uh, the rationality built into nature, but we're also prone to flights of fancy, jumping to conclusions, that our, our, our cognition is also affected by the fall. And so we have to check our ideas, our theoretical ideas, against reality. And that also gave an impulse to, for empirical investigation and the whole program of, of experimentation. Right, it's called the scientific method. And it's kind of funny to me. When, when I you know, discovered this, obviously more recently than you, but it's astonishing how clear it is and how inextricably intertwined Christian faith is with science. So the fact that we're living in this world that pretends like Christians are somehow, you know, off against science, you know, not only is that not true, but exactly the opposite is true. Well, just to name one example that's to me particularly inspiring is the, um, the Principia that was the, the book about universal gravitation by, written by Newton, and the later theological epilogue called the General Scolium that he added to that, where he reflected on the, uh, the, the idea that God was the, the, the unseen force that enforced this order behind everything, but, uh, and the idea that in God all things are held together or consist. And also, in that epilogue, he also made uh, 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 design arguments. Uh, this most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. That's right in Newton. That's right in the general scolium to the Principia, arguably the greatest work of physics ever written, or one of the top three or four and at, at the very least. It's, it's incredible how deeply uh, integrated the theological perspective was into the scientific work, so much so that Rodney Stark, the uh, historian of science from Baylor who wrote the great book, uh, For the Glory of God, with Princeton Press, titled the book, For the Glory of God. For him, that, he realized that that was the motivation of these early scientists. 